Hey everybody, Tim Welsh here. When I was younger, I hated watching football. And that really should be no surprise. My family was a Cleveland Browns household. It was the late 90s. And uh, not a great time in the storied annals of American sport for the fair city of Cleveland. Uh, and the real reason why I really didn't like watching football was because my dad would come home from church. He'd be all full of the spirit and excited and having a great time. And he'd get changed and have a cold beer. And he'd sit down and he'd start watching the TV. And his demeanor would be like, here we go. This is it. This I feel this one. This is the day, baby. Come on. Which quickly became. They never win. They never win. And if they never win, I never win. Why can't I win? Dad, the trick is not minding that it hurts. I don't think you like football, Dad. I love this game! And I was thinking about it, and I think that that is why a lot of us kind of shy away from Shakespeare, right? The best you're going to get when you're in high school is a really enthusiastic, excellent teacher, which, by the way, I had lots of great English teachers in middle school and high school. but. The kids that are around you, the people that are around you, they don't really care about this, probably. And if they do, maybe there's one or two of them. So you're not watching or being exposed to really some high quality sportsmanship, if you know what I mean. So I thought instead of getting into the technical stuff directly, I have a bunch of videos that I have in mind and a lot of them have a lot to do with text analysis and history and things that I really think are fun and we're gonna make fun. But before we get into that, we're gonna do something much more simple. I've made a video just as a fan uh, or making a video just as a fan of a performance of Shakespeare. So I want to share with you today uh, a clip, several clips, but one in particular of one of my favorite recordings of a performance of Shakespeare live. Before we get into that, I'm going to set the stage for you just a little bit. This comes from everybody's favorite Shakespeare play, Richard II. Right? No, nobody, care. nobody cares about Richard II. Richard II is an excellent play. What it's really about is about a monarchy in decline and a king in decline. Professor Marjorie Garber, she's a professor at Yale, brilliant mind for Shakespeare. She goes in her book Shakespeare After All and she goes play by play and analyzes the plays in the text. Really wonderful stuff. She describes Richard as an X character, which she refers to as an X character. And it means that there's it's a character that ascends upon one axis, he goes up in some ways, while descending at the same time on another axis. So in the play, he kind of starts becoming this almost mystical figure. He, he's realizing the grandeur of the regal poetry, of the narrative of being a king. He's seeing all of the kind of cosmic interworkings of what it means to be invested with this much power, right? But at the same time, his kingdom is falling apart. His his uh, followers are either sycophants or traitors, and they are all taking in league with his cousin, Harry Bolingbroke, who is about to become Henry IV. Clearly does not go very well for our friend Richard. So at this moment of the play, it's Act 3, Scene 2, we find him kind of at the center of this X. And it is the moment that he begins to realize how very badly this is about to go for him. And he comes out and he says an actually a pretty well-known speech in the Shakespeare world. He says, For God's sakes, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the deaths of kings. You can like see Shakespeare sitting in his study, like My Chemical Romance blaring in the background with his fingerless fishnet gloves. But it's a very heavy speech, obviously. And the atmosphere is very heavy. Let's take a look at a couple, at a couple of clips of famous performances of this speech. First, David Tennant. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground. And tell sad stories of the death of kings. Wow, right? He's so good. He's so good. Uh, anyway, moving on to someone more classical in nature, uh, Sir John Gilgood. 
For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. You just hear that gravitas, right? Very heavy stuff. I'm going to turn your attention to now one of my favorite living actors. And he is one of my favorite living actors in part because of this clip. This is Mark Rylance. This is his performance of Richard II. Let's talk of graves, of worms and epitaphs. Let's choose executors and talk of wills, and yet not so. For what can we bequeath but our deposed bodies to the ground? Our lands, our lives, and all are Bolingbrokes, and nothing may we call our own but death, and, and that small model of the barren earth, which serves as paste and cover to our bones. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. <laughs> stop there really fast. I want to talk about a couple of things. First of all, where's that atmosphere? Where's that oppressive, scary heaviness that we're used to with this speech? It's gone. He must be doing it wrong, right? He doesn't understand the severity of the situation. And yet, there's something about this delivery that is already carrying us through the text. It's like a wind that blows through the speech. Now we have the momentum to get us through this very emotionally taxing thing because the actor isn't allowing himself to wallow in the emotion of it. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But even look at the way he's dressed. Look at the way the stage is set. Actors are never alone. There is no acting in a vacuum. There are directors, choreographers, stage management. There are costume designers, lighting designers, props artisans, scenic painters, scenic designers, all of these people working in unison to tell this story. So when you're sitting at home reading Shakespeare by yourself, it's very difficult because you have to do all of this work on your own. But if you're watching a live performance, the clues that you can get from this amalgamation of talent inform the audience as to what is going on on multiple levels simultaneously. Look at the way he's dressed, the colors as opposed to the saturation of everybody else, how light and airy he is. He is distant from the people around him. There is a disconnect. It's clear even the way his, his breeches bunch up against his backside, the line of the cloth hanging down from his sleeves, he looks awkward. It's like the crown doesn't even fit him exactly, which is not... Surprising, because Mark Rylance kind of got a big old weird head. Speaking of his big old weird head, which I love, by the way, look at those eyebrows. Like that he can't control. But you can see those dark eyebrows. You can see those from the back of the house, man. He can register, do one thing with his face, one motion, one change, and I'm sure he knows exactly what he's doing. And you're going to clock that as an audience member. So we have a masterful actor breathing energy and life into the text. Not allowing the text to ride down on him, using it instead of his own volition. The speech goes on. Richard gives examples of the historic bad endings for kings. He kind of keeps that laugh all the way through it. We're going to skip to the ending. You should watch the whole thing. We're going to skip to the ending here, and I want you to just watch from this to the end. So co cover your heads. Mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form, ceremonies, duty. For you have but mistook me all this while. I live with, friend, with, with bread like you. Feel want, taste grief. Need friends. <laughs> Subjected thus, how can you say to me, I am a king? The most important part of the speech was in there. Did you catch it? And no, it wasn't the part where he fell over and cried. That was very powerful. He was very talented. The most important part of the speech is when he screwed up. 
the line that he's supposed to say is, I live with bread. I need food to survive. I need human sustenance. I'm alive like you are. But he says, I live with friends and corrects himself. Why does that matter? It matters, folks, because that's what the whole speech in the eyes of Mark Rylance is about. And so, when Rylance screws up in that speech, his mind is dead set like a laser beam, so focused on his objective that even his mistakes resonate with the character. He has a Freudian slip in character. That is some, yeah, that's some good acting. Look at the way his eyes dart back and forth to check in with other people as to whether or not they're listening to him, seeking their approval, even though he's the monarch. His almost pathological insecurity, his need for people to see him as a man. He's alone and he's scared and he's a child, and he's me, and maybe he's you. And that's why great Shakespearean acting is so powerful, because it can take a text and 400 years of theater history, of tradition, of all of these things, and we get very precious about it. Oh, things should be done this way. This is what this punctuation means. This phrasing means on and on and on. And then one person can come in and just twist it. And suddenly the world is a little bit different. Something you took for granted as unchanging, as oppressive and dark, becomes light and vibrant and magical. That is the talent of a good actor who's focusing on an objective, not wallowing down in their feelings. Doing something. And there is no better playwright to have an actor inspired to do something than William Shakespeare. That's all we're going to do today, folks. Thank you so much for letting me rattle on about this. Please, I'm going to link that Mark Rylance scene in, the, in the, uh, the notes below. Please watch it. Please watch everything you can of him. He is bloody brilliant, and you deserve it. So I hope to see you soon. Take care of yourselves. We're talking more coming up about some technical stuff, some fun things. What makes Shakespeare so great? Why do we care anyway? It's going to be a great time. Peace. Have a good one.